Hello, I'm Mandy McLeod. Welcome to Straight Talk, brought to you by Straight Furrow. Coming up in the show, effluent storage is vital for compliance, says Environment Waikato. We look at why farmers in the Waikato are better, but not good enough. Landcorp is cautiously optimistic about how profitable agriculture will be in the future. And first there were the milk wars, and now there are the milk games. We discuss Fonterra's call for immediate changes to milk regulations. Joining me today is CEO of Dairy New Zealand, Dr Tim Mackle, and CEO of CDAX, Greg Shearer. Welcome, guys. Good morning. Good to be here, Mary. Now, Tim, in the latest flyover by um, Environment Waikato's effluent compliance team, it's shown a rise in compliance. However, the level of non-compliance has actually decreased, but the issues have got worse. This is in contrast to those farmers in the Greater Wellington region who are celebrating actually dropping their level of non-compliance full stop. So Tim, the Waikato's had a really wet winter. Do you think this is reason enough as to why there were significantly worse issues found on Waikato farms this spring? I think it's certainly contributed, Mandy. We can't lay all the blame at the weather. Yeah, the first thing to look at is that, you know, the season to date, it looks like the results are still going in a positive direction. I mean, the first um, it, it results indicate we're, we're shifting from that 20% mark down to 10% mm. um, significant non-compliance, which is great, but obviously we're still not where we need to be, so we all accept that, but it's heading in the right direction. Two things I understand that really happened this year. The first is that, and they're management related, the first is that because of the good milk price and the great autumn and the weather that farmers had, they milked on longer, and so ponds filled up, and uh, and so that, that is a consequence mm -hmm. of milking on longer and having cows in the dairy. And so, you know, the 12 days of rain, I think it was, came later on in the piece. And, uh, and that, of course, you know, meant that a lot of farms had nowhere to put it. So that exacerbated it. The second thing I understand is that, uh, you know, farmers did feed their animals more in the race because of that wet. And, of course, we know that's not, not allowed. So that caused issues around uh, infringement as well. But if you look at what happened in the Waikato compared to the Greater Wellington, yeah, it's, a, it's a good result for the Greater Wellington region. But we still have to understand that, you know, there are 200-odd there are farmers there compared to about 2,700 in the Waikato. So while we can run lots of events and have people out on the ground and Fonterra have got more people and we've got more people doing that, at the end of the day, you've got a lot more people to get around, and so it just takes a little bit longer. So good result in the Greater Wellington. Mm -hmm. We are heading in the right direction in the Waikato, and I'm confident that we'll see further gains. Now, Greg, your company, CDAX, has been doing quite a bit of work in this area around trying to minimise um, the displacement of fertilisers and effluent, um, well, effluent not so much, but fertilisers, etc. Have you seen a bigger uptake in some of your spreaders and things like that as a result of, say, the, the wet winter and people becoming more environmentally conscious? Mandy, I think that's a good question. I, I genuinely believe farmers need to be on the journey and we have got a group of farmers that want to get on these new journeys. However, it's all about timing and it's all about education. And as we've moved through the process, we've found very clearly that there's uh, a need to actually explain the longer term benefits mm -hmm. and certainly traceability is, is, a, is a key benefit, but it's uh, got to be displayed that it's got worth value for them. Surely people actually know now what's required to store their effluent for a period of time. Why is that message not the one that's getting out there? Why are people not updating their infrastructure? There's uh, different regions are facing different pressures at different times. And while there is an understanding out of needs and wants for farming and for the economy, it's actually a timing and it's actually that education and timing coming together at the same time. Good answer. Happen. Good answer, I like that one. OK, with the Green Party on the warpath, do you think that farmers need to be more vigilant than ever about the potential for water contamination? I think farmers are vigilant, and I don't think we need a party or politics actually guiding them in this area. It comes back to my previous answer that it's timing, and it will happen. Great. It's a bit like the hair thing, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> Good things take time, That's but it right. will happen. OK, New Zealand's largest farmer, Landcorp, is cautiously optimistic about the future for profitability on pastoral, um, pastoral farms. Their CEO, Chris Kelly, believes that the high <coughs> New Zealand dollar is going to eventually bring a decrease to beef and dairy, but that lamb is going to hold strong. Tim, do you think this is a fair assessment? Oh, it could well be, and um, Chris is quite right. He's a smart guy and um, looks, has looked at these things for, for many, many years. Um, at the end of the day, though, you know, even the dairy companies don't know exactly how things are going to play out. So I think we have to be prudent about the future. We know that 
uh, we've had a good run in the last couple of years. We know that the dollar is putting some real pressure and credit, I think, to the dairy companies in particular so far to be able to maintain and even come out with forecasts like they have in mm. spite of that. So obviously something's good, something good is working there. Um, but you know we do have to be prudent, and we know that while the the medium to long term outlook for for all of our good and high protein commodities is really positive, we can expect that this easing is going to continue for a little while, maybe before it comes back up again. So you know let's get back to to making sure that our systems, our farming systems, are resilient, and we can adapt to make sure that we can uh, we can deal with it. Okay, so Fonterra is calling for an immediate change to the way that milk is regulated in New Zealand, call, calling some processes that have been gaming the system. Greg, what do you think about this? Have we got some processes gaming and what does the gaming really entail? Mandy, I believe we have got some processes gaming and uh, I would suggest that it's not as complicated as uh, has been portrayed. I think there's a simple way to uh, control that and that would be simply by uh, saying product that's used on the local market has a price, product that's been exported has a different price of raw material inputs. That's just a uh, mechanical process to sort that one out. But I believe it needs to be sorted out for New Zealand farmers. So you don't think this act of taking milk and having a buyer, almost a buyer created invoice is not fraud? That, that they're gaming the system by coming up with offshore companies and things like that. Is that not slightly dodgy? Oh, most definitely <laughs> uh, anything that uh, is going through multiple accounts is suspect. But I believe that's just learnings that we now have in place after 10 years of the restructuring bill, and I think those, it's time for it to move on. So, Tim, what do you, chance do you think they've got of getting these, these changes made through Parliament, that the gaming will stop and it will become what it was really sent up to do to increase competitiveness in the local market? Uh, look, I, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't want to comment on, on the chances, but you know, we know that the government are, are committed, certainly post-election, to uh, sinking their teeth into this thing and helping us. I mean, I... I don't know the details of, of, of what's going on there. Um, it doesn't sound good if that is the case. It really doesn't. Um, and what I probably worry about uh, from an industry point of view overall is is the general sentiment uh, in the industry and our ability to work together. Um, and when we talk about competitiveness and setting that within the marketplace, we also have to look at our competitiveness overall as a dairying nation and how competitive are we uh, relative to our, our, our competitors overseas. And and you know we just have to be very careful. Whatever uh, regulatory constraints get put in place, or even are in place, don't undermine the competitiveness of our of our big companies, particularly Fonterra. Um, and that um, you know while we have an even playing field, we've got to make sure that the big game is played overseas, and that's where we we need to make good profits to return that to all New Zealanders. Mm -hmm. So you know whatever gets put in place, I think it just has to be relatively quick. We can't uh, I guess meander along too long on it, and um, we've got to be careful that that the collective spirit that our industry has had for so long, for decades, over a century, that we maintain, maintain that. that. Brilliant. OK, so coming up after the break, we're going to look at the payout that Fonterra has confirmed to shareholders for the current season. Is this the last of the hedonistic dairy days? The latest research from European Organisation for Nuclear Research shows that it is cosmic rays in the sun, not human activity, that is responsible for climate change. So what will this mean for ETS? And trading amongst farmers is causing some angst for Fonterra shareholders. We discuss the pros and cons for this strategy. All this when we return. Welcome back to Straight Talk, brought to you by Straight Burrow. Earlier this week, Fonterra announced a payout for the coming season of between $7.15 and $7.25. Tim, this is an extremely good start for the season and positive news for dairy farmers. But Land Corp has, Corp has suggested a softening for dairy coming up in the next year. Do you think this could be our last year of these heady heights? There's no doubt that you know what comes up eventually comes down for a while, So we, and we have to prepare for that. Everybody's been talking about volatility in the last 12 to 24 months, and so and I think farmers have taken that message on board. So you know, at the end of the day, uh, it's a really positive forecast. We need to be prudent as well, and I think farmers are. You know, they've spent uh, a lot, I think, paying down debt. I mean, our dairy base figures indicated that maybe the, the term debt was somewhere around $22, $23 sort of at the start of last season per kilo and we're heading down towards the 20 mark now and with another good year it could head down towards $18 on average. So that's a great result 
Um, and in terms of operating costs, yeah, going forward, farmers need to keep an eye on it because that is the biggest driver of, of profit. You don't think that we're going to you know, see some blasé attitude come in for this year that people have kind of like screwed themselves down really tight for the last couple of years and paid off debt that now they might just kind of let themselves go a wee bit? Well, that would be a positive thought from, uh, from my other business hat point of view, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I agree with what Tim's saying. I think generally farmers have become prudent since 2008, and uh, I see them being very reserved and being very cautious, but not being afraid to invest if they see the benefit. So what do you think this is going to mean to our economy? Like Fonterra is returning something like you know, $11 billion. Will this decrease if the payout comes back? And what do you think it will actually have to the, to the overall New Zealand economy? Will it slow us down? I, I, I don't believe that there will be a slowdown. I know that there will be uh, possibly some cautious approach being taken out there, and I think that's being uh, recommended by the Fonterra board this year, and I applaud that. However, I genuinely believe that uh, dairy prices will remain firm and the reason I'm confident of that is uh, the Asian uh, demand path that we're currently on. Mm -hmm. Maybe in the future that may change if uh, production starts to uh, germinate uh, elsewhere but at the moment I think things look pretty firm. Mm -hmm. it's, I, mean, it's a, I agree with Greg, it's a really interesting uh, period that we're in right now where we don't quite know where things are going to go and you know, as Greg's indicated we we are still, uh, you know, our reliance has increased around Asia, which is a good thing because the economies at the moment that seem to be in trouble in maybe Europe and North America aren't, uh, aren't uh, so, uh, so much a focus for us. They still are. But then in a secondary sense, they are because obviously Asia sells to those countries. So that's going to be a really important thing to see how that plays out for us. But you're right, it does have a big impact on us. And, and we know that the current account deficit has benefited hugely in the last year or two and the government uh, I know that as well from dairy and, and being helped out by other prime industries recently as well. That's all a good thing. Um, and we know that you know every dollar shift in payout um, is, is a difference of 270 odd dollars in the back pocket of every New Zealander. So you know a slide will definitely have an impact but, but um, with Greg I don't think it'll go down too much. Great, that's good news, good news. So do you think that the industry is doing enough, Tim I'm going to ask you this one here, for farmers to plan on having any future price decreases. You know, we've seen a change where banks were doing a lot of budgeting for farmers and now that the reliance has come back to their produce their own cash flows and that, are they ready to have to start to, to do them for real? Short answer is no, I don't think they are. In fact, 12 months, maybe 18 months ago, we surveyed all the banks and talked to them and engaged and we figured out that probably only 15% if you're lucky, maybe 10% of all farmers were monitoring cash budgets on mm. a monthly basis which was a little alarming and we've had good engagement with banks recently um, about how we can sort of help turn that round together to, to help farmers give them the tools. There's stuff going on, you know, in, in the after the 2008 crash, um, going into that 09, 10 year when we looked at a 450 sort of milk price, mm. we ran a bunch of type management seminars across the country, um, you know, donated time from farmers, that was fantastic and, and we need to sort of haul that stuff out again I think and, and, and bring that to farmers' attention that there's some good tools here about being prudent um, for whatever might come in the next 12 to 24 months. Awesome. Okay, now for something slightly controversial. Latest research from Denmark and from CERN has proven that it's cosmic rays and the sun that has got more impact on climate change, not human beings. This is, was an article written by Lawrence Solomon. And he, call, he calls for current climate models to be substantially reviewed. So guys, you've read the article, what do you think? Mandy, I guess I'd have to put myself in the uh, clear position of I don't think there's enough information out there and uh, there's too many, um, I guess, walls being built with not enough information and I would encourage more gathering of information in the meantime, a little bit, be a little bit more cautious. Oh, I wouldn't have picked you for a fence to agree, <laughs> Tim. <laughs> uh, well, I think Greg's right, the author himself did say it's early days, so let's not get too carried away, but you know, we should be reviewing that all the time. Uh, as an international community, we should be looking at it all the time to make sure that you know we've got more information coming through that we do we do look at that in the big picture. But <clears throat> at the end of the day, um, you know I, I think we've never necessarily supported the introduction of agriculture into the ETS itself. We do think that resource use efficiency, in terms of um, you know water, greenhouse gases, fertilizer, oil, all those things, energy 
is crucial for the globe going forward and we should partake in that. We've got a lot of money, industry money, farmers money, government money yep. going into research to do that stuff. So we'll carry on doing that because ultimately we're looking for more productivity and less footprint um, irrespective of any regulatory regimes that get put in around it or any new uh, reports that come out which haven't quite been substantiated yet. So do you think, because there's a hell of a lot of money has gone into this thing about it's humans, it's, it's bovine flatulence, it's all of these things that are actually causing climate change. <coughs> do you think that there is going to be any amount of evidence that'll turn this ship around or have we got too many people with too many entrenched ideas based on profitability that will never allow this kind of research to foster? Mandy, I genuinely think there's too many agendas out there and those agendas are not always uh, based on science. I think a lot of them are sometimes based on economic gain for individuals. Yep. Tim, do you think that there's enough um, support for research like this? I mean, you know, the Danes brought this uh, to IPEC nearly 10 years ago, so it's not exactly new, new, and yet it hasn't been accepted. What will it take? And do you think that research like this will slow down the entrance of New Zealand into ETS? Uh, I don't know that it will. Uh, in terms of the latter question, Mandy, I don't think it will necessarily slow down entry. I think um, the signals we're hearing from the government, which um, I'm pleased to hear are that um, it's nonsensical to bring agriculture into an ETS if no other competitor is doing that, particularly given that we are, we believe, the most, if not one of the mm -hmm. most efficient car uh, producers of, of food in the world from a carbon perspective. It doesn't make a lot of sense at all, um, but that we should still strive towards, you know, reducing our excellence. footprint and producing more at the same time. And, yep. and so that's it's a good message. Great. Trading amongst farmers is a proposed scheme by Fonterra to increase its capital base. Greg, do you think that farmers have got a lot to gain if this is accepted? I believe the industry's got a lot to gain if this is accepted in the fact that it will neutralise um, the way forward and it will give everybody a clear pathway on the way forward and you won't have just it being shared equally across those that one, don't want to do it, and two, that they can't afford it. Do you think that there's enough good information out there talking to farmers about the pros and cons? Or is it really um, a fear around a loss of control that's going to drive this argument, this debate, if you like, if there will indeed be a debate? There's two, two answers to that. The first one is, is there enough information out there? I think there's a lot of information out there, and it's being consumed in different ways. Generally speaking, the issue in my mind still comes back to ownership and control and it's that that needs to be addressed and once that is addressed, I think farmers will have confidence to move forward. Brilliant. Tim, just very, very quickly, do you think that uh, trading amongst farmers will help or hinder bringing new entrants into the industry? Uh, look, it's too, too early for me to say that, Mandy. Um, clearly there's a, there's a capital issue and there's a control issue and we need to find a balance between between solving those two issues and so um, it's a good discussion to have. Um, I think things look like they're progressing in a good direction at the moment but um, I mean we need new entrants, there's no doubt about it. We need new people coming through, you know, as the, the young people of today are, are, the, the, are going to be the owners of the farms tomorrow and, and so the current uh, farm owners need that as well and so that's going to be an important consideration I think. Brilliant. We're going to ask Tim and Greg after the break what's got their goat? Is it going to be a rant? Or is it going to be a rave? You'll have to join us after the break to find out. Welcome back to Straight Talk, brought to you by Straight Burrow. It's time now for our weekly rant. <laughs> and rave. Tim, what you got? Uh, a little bit of a rant, really. I think um, talking to farmers, they're feeling quite bruised about dairy farmers taking a pounding in the last 12 to 24 months, uh, whether it be you know sustainability issues and or more recently milk price and and I, and you got to feel for them. On the sustainability front, I mean you know we've got great opportunities and we know that with with world demand for dairy, it is about more for less in terms of being able to produce more because there's a lot of opportunity in New Zealand to do that. Existing farms and new ones, 
where it makes sense to do so. Um, but you know, in terms of the science that we need to solve issues, whether it be in the Waituna or the Huranui or, or wherever, we need in a small country like New Zealand for people to work together. And so what I want to see is less of this partisan approach to political camps and so on. Oh, it's an election year, so let's be honest here. We're going to be used as cannon fodder to, to a degree. But more collective approach to solving issues. You know, for New Zealand, we can't afford to not identify the issues and then identify real solutions and try and put them in place. And to do that, we're going to actually have to get scientists from CRI, some universities and so on, working together on the problems, sharing the information, not councils or, or not industry people holding the information to themselves and, and then releasing it. We have to share the information and work out what the right thing to do is. And we can't have you know, professors who might be aligned with political parties being being referred to to talk, for example, on the Manawatu River. We can't have that. You know, we have to have independent, as a, an ex-scientist myself, if there's, if there's such a thing, you know, I, I don't think you should be aligned with anyone politically. You've got to absolutely uh, stick to the facts. Uh, and, and so that's the key thing going forward. So let's all work together. Let's solve the issues that, that dairy and other agricultural areas have and enjoy the opportunities that are ahead of us. So no more Partesian princesses. Could say that. <laughs> <laughs> I, you said that. Man, yeah. <laughs> Greg, what have you got for us? Well, I've got a rave, but it's hard to follow a passioned uh, view that Tim's just had. Oh, I'm sure yours will be passionate <laughs> just as much. <laughs> uh, look, I'd just like to take uh, the debate out of the current milk uh, pricing issues that are out there. I think uh, they are quite easily to sort out. It just needs to be unbundled. Number one, I don't think the farmer or the producer should be uh, in any way having to earn less on the milk that's sold in New Zealand. I believe if there is going to be any looking at what is happening out there, look at the, uh, look at the uh, processor and look at the marketer and then see where to from there. In New Zealand we lack competition uh, and because of that we have these debates. But let's not let the producer, the farmer, suffer as a result of those mm. two other areas that need to be reviewed. Well they kind of go hand in hand really. I mean, you know, the farmer is mm. getting bruised you know, even just by the public um, perception of what's happening with the price of milk, as if the farmer has got any control or say over it. Absolutely. So yeah, I think that um, it's about time we got some pink bats for those farmers out there and wrap them up. Absolutely, and the New, New Zealand farmer does a brilliant job and they need to be commended on it and they should not have to be brought into this one at all. I think they deserve to be rewarded fairly and if that's based on the international price, that's good. The other two areas can be easily benchmarked against uh, international uh, options and it's not a big issue. Do you think that, because there's, there's a theme here between the two of them, I mean we're talking about a Partesian approach with scientists and, and other you know, professors in and around the area of sustainability for example, but aren't we also seeing a Partesian approach to, to milk, um, pro, you know, production of you know, milk, not so much production of milk, although maybe it'll come down to that with the different farmers getting into different camps, but with the different processes themselves also getting more and more entrenched in their position and we will lose some of this collective um, 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 spirit. wealth, mm -hmm. spirit, um, mm -hmm. that we are, we are known for and that will eventually be our downfall. Yes, we don't need to dilute that collective wealth and knowledge bank that we have in New Zealand. That's what makes us different and that what gives us a point of difference in our overseas marketing. We can be strong here in New Zealand, hence my previous uh, view that I believe we will be able to maintain good firm pricing in New Zealand because we have got traceability. If we can keep that in mind and deliver a clean green New Zealand product overseas, we can keep ahead of the competition and the currency issues that we face. And do you think with the influx of visitors to the Rugby World Cup, they are going to see and be convinced of a clean green New Zealand image? Depends how successful New Zealanders, they might be too drunk to notice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tim, are you confident that they'll... Uh, well, hopefully the weather gods are going to be kind to us too, because as you know, when you're travelling, it has a big impact on your perceptions. But above all, you know, I've heard people say this in the last few days, and it's true, we've got to be very hospitable to these people coming in and show them that we are a very friendly country. I was over in Australia last week and I thought, you know, the Australians again are pretty friendly and I think we need to make sure that Kiwis are too and just examine ourselves to make sure that we, we're hosting them well. That'll have a big impact. I think it'll have a bigger impact than anything. The games or the weather is how well we host these people. Absolutely. So it's an exciting time.
Oh, it's fantastic. So my wee rave, my wee rave is going to be for New Zealand, for the All Blacks, and I just think we're going to have an awesome couple of weeks, and it doesn't really matter. No, it does matter who wins or loses. I was going to say it doesn't really matter. I was just going to take that, but no way. I say go the All Blacks. Let's hope that they can take it all the way in what will probably be New Zealand's only World Cup on New Zealand soil. Kia kaha. Okay, that wraps up our latest edition of Straight Talk, brought to you by Straight Furrow. I'd really like to thank my guests, Dr Tim Mackle and Greg Shearer, and thanks to you too for watching. Remember to check out my blog online at country99tv.co.nz. I'd love hearing from you. I will catch you next week, and in the meantime, keep on smiling.